Yeah, I'm uh, Camille uh, Nguyen Van. Uh, for those into Vietnamese tunnel system, it's Nguyen Van. And um, yeah, I'm going to present uh, this topic today to you, uh, programming languages for polyglots. So I can see that uh, Windows machine uh, messed up a bit the emojis. Uh, I don't have a mustache, right? Uh, but it added here. It, it looks quite different on my Mac, so uh, uh, here, here it is, the first problem. Uh, well, let's start. Uh, so I'm going to divide the presentation into those uh, three parts. We'll start with uh, what programming languages are. I would like to present a, a difficult definition, a simple definition, and then uh, some comparisons between programming and natural languages. Um, yeah, so um, let's start with this definition, which I uh, took from Wikipedia which is, uh, I call it difficult definition, because uh, it has um, a couple of uh, diff difficult words, phrases, like, uh, oh shoot, you can't see that. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, but you can see it here, right? So for example, the word algorithms is, uh, well, not everyone knows what algorithm is. Uh, also we have, uh, well, computer programming. There's one phrase, which is formal language, which to you might sound, okay, I understand what it is, because it's like a business English, English of the Queen, English that I am trying to use when I uh, talk to you, hopefully. Um, but it's not, it's actually a difficult mathematical construct, uh, which we don't want to deep into, uh, dive into, right? Maybe next year I'm gonna present why polyglots should learn math. Don't worry, no, I'm not gonna do that. Um, but here's the uh, a simpler definition. Um, Let's see if you can see the colors. Oh yeah, it's much better here. Okay, uh, so you probably intuitively understand all of those uh, words. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go through each of them um, quickly. So computers, in this definition, computers could be um, replaced by anything, like any machine which is, uh, has some kind of com computing power, whatever it means, like, but, but intuitively you understand. It could be a phone, it could be a car nowadays. Uh, well, we'll probably not end up programming cars unless we work at Tesla. But I know that last year there was one uh, person who actually worked at Tesla. So uh, maybe uh, he's not here. But uh, yeah, so we can replace computers with uh, machine, phones, laptops. Passive, what I mean passive? What I mean by passive? So um, uh, the thing with uh, I would say that we all use all those uh, devices, but our communication with them is still quite passive. It's like uh, going to Japan with this, you know, uh, phrases in Japanese with uh, 2,000 of them and trying to uh, talk to Japanese by, just by reading them. It's like you cannot create things, right? You cannot create a real uh, input. This is actually what happens to most of us, non-programmers. Uh, we can use apps, we can use uh, programs, but it's always defined by the companies that stand behind those uh, products. Um, but uh, with programming languages, we can uh, become, uh, we can like start communicating with computers in a more active way. Uh, you don't have to become, you know, founders of uh, Facebook or Microsoft, uh, but it still can help you. So here's an example that I wanted to show you from my personal life. So I'm really into learning Chinese. And I uh, compiled this huge list of words that I stumbled upon, uh, stumbled upon uh, during my, well, three years of uh, learning Chinese. Adrian is here, he knows how it is and uh, how I struggle with uh, Chinese. Um, so it doesn't mean that I know these words, but for sure it is like I didn't know more than the words I have in this list. But then one day I realized that when you uh, want to pass those HSK exams, uh, it's, they have limits like, okay, you know 600 characters, then you're probably at this level. 2,000 characters, you're at this level. So I wanted to, to know, okay, probably I know like half of those words, or maybe one third in characters. So I would like to know how many uh, characters I have in total. Uh, but now, how can I calculate it? Uh, so I started looking for an app, for uh, built-in uh, functions in Google Spreadsheet. I couldn't find that. but. Uh, fortunately, I'm a programmer. I know uh, this uh, programming language called Python. Uh, you don't have to understand it. You probably can't even see it correctly, right? Yeah, there are some words. I'm so sorry about that, but uh, believe me, it's a computer program which works. 
Um, and uh, yeah, it gives me the answer. And it's only eight, nine lines of code. Um, so this is what I mean by passive versus active. You can force computers to do whatever you want once you know programming languages, right? So in this case, yeah, I know the all uh, unique, a number of unique characters in my spreadsheet. Okay, so now we are going to talk a bit, a, a bit about uh, history, but very briefly. So uh, programming languages were, most of them were created in the last 100 years even though foundations were, well, all this started with um, way before uh, when we started having like modern computers based on uh, transistors and uh, some of you might not even know, but before we used to have computers which were made out of wood. So uh, it was, I think, in the 19th century. So already at this point in time, we had uh, mathematicians which started working on how to talk to computers in an uh, effective way. But um, this exponential growth of number of languages happened really in the 20th century. So if you go to Wikipedia, uh, to the list of most prominent languages, uh, we'll find out that there are around 700. It's very difficult to, look, uh, to, to measure it um, because like anyone can create a programming language nowadays. Uh, there are actually courses that let you do that. I will talk about them at the, at the end of the presentation. Um, so there are other sources like this one, which states that we have maybe uh, around, well, a number of languages is counted in thousands. I think there are around seven thousands. This is actually a fa fa family tree of programming languages, um, if you can't see it really clearly. And um, here is a simplified family tree of most really top ten like I would say majority of top 10 uh, languages used nowadays is on this uh, family tree. So you can see that it's quite similar to how languages copy from each other. Uh, I mean natural languages. Uh, they evolve, they uh, have similar features and they are influenced by one or more languages, right? So now we are going to talk about how complex uh, languages, programming languages are. Uh, in my opinion, um, programming is um, shown as, is presented as something super difficult that only chosen people can, can learn, only uh, mathematicians and scientists and it's, or super smart kids that live somewhere in Silicon Valley and create those uh, amazing apps. But um, I would like to show you that it's not necessarily true. There are languages that are easier to learn and, uh, and yeah, that's it. So yeah, let's talk about complexity. Be be before starting, uh, oh no, you still, again, you can't see the word must, which is very important in this definition, but I'm gonna read it uh, aloud. So languages, natural languages, differ essentially in what they must convey and not in what they may convey, which means each natural, languages, uh, natural language is more or less uh, equally powerful if you go to a um, tropical forest in Brazil, they might not have a word for computer, but once a person from this tribe uh, goes to, I don't know, attends a university and starts the program, they will find out how to explain this, um, this, um, this word to, to, their, uh, to, to people from, from the tribe, right? So um, it's very similar with uh, programming languages. Uh, they are equally powerful, most of them, um, and, um, but they differ in what they must convey. So let me give you an example. Uh, with, yeah, there's supposed to be a Chinese flag here if you don't know what uh, language it is, but it's messed up. So uh, in Chinese, when you say, um, and you want to translate it into English, it gets a bit complicated because you can translate it into uh, I went, I've gone, I had gone, depending on uh, what are you talking about uh, if there was an action before the action that you were talking about right now and, uh, and all those uh, details. Then you go to a language like Russian and uh, it's also, it gets even more complex. It's impossible to, to say I went without implying what gender, uh, what, what's my gender, right? So if I say uh, it means I'm a, I'm a female and if I say uh, it means I'm a, I'm a man, uh, I'm a male, right? So 
And even though you don't want to talk about it, like I don't want to specify my gender, it doesn't mean that in Chinese you cannot specify your gender. Obviously you can, right? You can say, uh, I went and then I'm a woman, and that's basically the, the same information. But if you want to say just, I went uh, in Russian, you have to add all those um, details. It's very similar with uh, programming languages. So you have this language called, uh, again, there are some of the things are, uh, are missing here, but it's written in a verbal language called Java, one of the most popular nowadays, which probably uh, contributes to this feeling that programming languages are uh, super difficult. It is one of those languages that uh, forces you to convey lots of additional info when you write a computer program. And then you have this uh, uh, programming language. Can you see uh, what's written in here? It's, it's print hello world. So these two programs are equivalent. Uh, they do exactly the same thing. They print uh, this string, this text, hello world, onto the screen or uh, onto a paper that you might have in your printer. Well, it depends how, your, um, set, how you set up your computer. And, but they do pretty much the same thing. But you can see that one of them is way easier, right? So this is complexity, how they differ, how programming languages differ in complexity. And um, now we are going to talk about vocabulary. Um, th this is my, my biggest problem, uh, especially in Chinese, where uh, I have to learn lots of vocabulary. So, and, um, and it's, it's not similar to anything I know already, right? So um, this is a lower bound. Actually, if we take uh, the biggest English dictionaries, we'll, it will turn out that Oxford Dictionary has 500,000 uh, entries or 1 million. Uh, the same with Chinese. There are dictionaries that state that there are 100,000 uh, characters. And about this lower bound, uh, which we can agree upon, is uh, good enough. Uh, in JavaScript, this is uh, one of the two languages that uh, I would uh, recommend you to learn, either JavaScript or Python. Uh, I will talk a bit more about this uh, later on or during the questions. Um, so it has only 63 keywords. Um, yeah, now we go we're going to have a, a tiny pause. So um, you remember that before I showed you the language called Java, and now I'm talking about JavaScript. So if there's one fact, remember that these are two separate languages, okay? And uh, your engineer friends or programming friends or developers will be amazed by, th by the fact that you know that. Uh, okay, let's, going back to, uh, let's go back to uh, vocabulary. So Python has even less keywords. It's 33. Uh, so these are two languages that I recommend, right? And the third one, Golang, uh, has 25, uh, 25 keywords. It's a language created quite recently in I think uh, in the 21st century by Google. Um, they say uh, it's supposed to be super simple. In my opinion, it's not as simple as Python, but it's, it's good enough too. Um, so um, the good thing about all those keywords is that uh, if you attend this presentation, I uh, assume that you know English, and all of them uh, are basically English words. So it's not gonna be difficult to, to remember them. But, um, actually, yeah, I'm going to talk now about uh, grammar. Uh, so, who of you likes to learn grammar? Who prefers grammar over uh, vocabulary? Yeah, I'm definitely one of those persons. I'm super amazed by when I, uh, I want to learn uh, Basque language just to understand what are the problems with the, with the grammar. Uh, so, I think you will like uh, learning the grammar of uh, programming languages because everything is very clearly uh, stated. Uh, the grammar is difficult, uh, more difficult than the grammar of uh, natural languages, but it's very succinct and precise. So, uh, as I said before, there are no exceptions. Actually, there are also not many exceptions when, uh, when we talk about vocabulary. Like, uh, if you learn different languages, and uh, they tend to use similar words for similar concepts. It's not like you learn uh, uh, this uh, Italian word for accento, uh, accent in French, right, or accent in English, and then you go to Brazil and it's sotaque. Like, uh, no one knows wh wh where it comes from, but uh, in case of programming languages, the etymology is uh, way more clear, so. 
Uh, there's uh, another uh, cool thing about, uh, uh, yeah, we don't have to talk in real time to computers. We can Google things. Uh, there are um, other websites uh, like uh, Stack Overflow, GitHub, which are like uh, Facebook for programmers or um, that help us to talk to computers effectively. So uh, there's no need to learn by heart. Uh, grammar people will uh, be amazed by, by, by it. Um, it's even worse, uh, even better. Um, so there are tools like uh, probably not all of you use Grammarly.com, but you have used some kind of a uh, grammar uh, spelling checker in the past, maybe uh, in Google Spreadsheet or in Microsoft Word. There's this website, Grammarly.com, that um, allows you to, um, like, once you install it, it helps you to write uh, proper, like, correct English sentences. It, it corrects everything. Uh, so I would say in the real world, a tiny percentage of people uses it um, on a daily basis. But uh, there, there are equivalents of a uh, very um, similar thing for programmers. And absolutely all programmers use it. So they use some kind of um, helping tools. I don't know if you can read it here, but what it says is, if language is English, print hello world. If language is Chinese, print well, ni hao shi jie, right? Which is hello world in Chinese. And if language is uh, Spanish, then print, uh, print uh, hola mundo. Uh, so you can see that when I type, this is actually a, a GIF um, of, of, a, of a program that I uh, wrote on my personal machine. Uh, when I type, uh, this environment helps me, uh, tries to autocomplete what I write. And I use it on a, on a daily basis. So there's really no need to remember things by heart when uh, programming. Next, uh, yeah, let's talk about how much time we need for learning uh, a programming language. I would say it depends, but once you get uh, very flu like fluent in one programming language, you understand all the concepts and you know how to build uh, various apps and things, then learning another programming language will be uh, very easy. Uh, I would say that it's you'll uh, decrease the time by a factor of 10. Great, so um, now we talked, we already talked about what programming language is and we saw a bit of a couple of comparisons. Now we are going to talk about why, which is kind of a summary of what you uh, saw in the first part. Yeah, so first benefit of knowing programming languages is that you can uh, become a programmer. Uh, even if you um, don't feel excited about it and you, you're scared of uh, sitting in a room and not talking to anyone, I will try to uh, um, rectify this and uh, convince you that it's actually a pretty cool job. So um, it's very easy to work uh, as a programmer in an international uh, environment. So I myself um, work in a company called Typeform based in Barcelona, where we are less than 200 people and we have over 30 nationalities. And uh, I'm happy, I'm privileged to use lots of languages that I know on a daily basis with uh, other employees. There are not only programmers, so I talk in, uh, well, I talk in Russian, Spanish, and it's really cool if you want to work in an international environment. A programming job will, uh, will help you with that. Uh, if you don't like to work with people in an office, you can work remotely, like some of the people here, right, uh, work remotely as uh, programmers, I know, uh, which is also amazing. You, In theory, you can travel anywhere and uh, just work. You, you go to Serbia, you learn Serbian and work for a company from, I don't know, France or the United States. Um, so uh, another thing is that uh, comparing to, I also, uh, going back to the previous slide, I know that the, there are other professions that allow you doing that, like uh, working as a translator also helps you, uh, allows you to work remotely with um, no problems, right, in many cases. But if you're not a translator, uh, programming is uh, the other way, right? One of the other ways. Um, regarding the standards, like if you compare, uh, if you're a doctor and you want to Okay, this Dr. Emoji uh, looks a bit uh, different too, but 
Uh, so if you're a doctor and you want to start working in Japan as a doctor, let's say you're uh, from Poland, it's going to be very difficult. Very difficult. You will first have to uh, translate your degree, maybe even do some additional um, additional uh, diploma, graduate from uh, some master program or whatever. Uh, but in case of programming, it's very simple. Programming is the same all around the world. And uh, one, if you want to move to another country, the only thing you have to do is to learn the local natural language, right? Or the culture. But we actually love doing that, so uh, that's a bonus. Uh, the second uh, benefit of knowing programming languages is uh, something I've already shown, like you can build apps and tools and programs. And um, if you're not convinced by writing those short scripts for Google Spreadsheet, or you don't want to build um, an next Duolingo, or Memrise, or or Google or whatever, uh, you can build something in between. So uh, there's another example of my personal project, which is declinator.com. That's a website where you can um, find declensions of Polish words. Uh, so in this example, I'm um, trying to get the declensions for the word computer. In Polish, it's computer, uh, right? Um, so you can, there are th lots of things that you can build. and. Uh, it's really enjoyable. And the third thing, uh, the last one, I'd say, is that once you dive deep into natural languages on one side and programming languages on the other, you'll find out that there's this common area which kind of uh, unites both branches, like linguistics, natural language processing, um, uh, formal, formal grammars. It's super interesting, and I think Learning one of them, learning natural languages, reinforces learning uh, programming languages and the other way around. So if you already know 10 natural languages and you think which language should be next, choose Python or JavaScript. Uh, it might be interesting. Great. So now we are going to talk about how. Well, give me a second. So how to learn programming languages? I'm going to go from the ways I recommend the least to a way that I recommend the most. So I'm going to start with the books. Uh, if it was a regular audience, I would probably not talk about books. But I know that there are some great self-learners uh, here uh, that polyglots really loved. Some of, of the polyglots love to learn uh, at home by themselves. And books are one of those uh, ways. Uh, even if it's if you're not one of those people, uh, books can be a good complementary resource, like a secondary resource to reinforce your uh, learning process. Um, the biggest problem with the books is that I haven't found a similar equivalent yet. But uh, if you find it, uh, let me know. Um, books also get obsolete because of the, of the fact that programming languages evolve very fast. So uh, before, one, like in the 19th century, we had next to zero programming languages, and now we have hundreds and thousands. So it's, uh, it's going to be, uh, it, get, it makes books uh, get obsolete. Uh, the other way is to learn with others. I'm going to show you here two examples of, uh, well, first I have to explain what a coding bootcamp is. So a coding bootcamp or a programming bootcamp is an intensified course which uh, usually promises you to get you a job after, uh, after you graduate, after two months only uh, as a programmer. And uh, here you have two examples of coding bootcamps that I know. They come, um, it's, not a, it's not an advertisement, it's just I happen to know these two places and I've been, I've been to them. I mean, to, the, uh, to their offices. And they're quite, quite good. Um, I know people who graduated from them and said, that's great, I got a job. I also know people who said, no, I didn't like it, and I didn't graduate, and I uh, spent uh, quite a bit of, of money. But uh, let's see how it works for you. Uh, so the concept is that uh, basically there are lots of people coming from around the, the globe to 
learn uh, JavaScript or, uh, or Python, I think, uh, from scratch. And they do it together. So it's really like uh, keeps you motivated. Uh, they're quite expensive. Uh, a coding bootcamp, in, at least in Barcelona, can cost anything from four to 7,000 euros per two months. They have scholarships, so uh, maybe you can cut this price in half in some cases, but it's still expensive. But I know that there are also coding boot camps in other countries, like in my, uh, in my homeland, in, my, in Poland, there are boot camps that um, are less intense, but take one year, and they are also cheaper. Uh, it depends, but in general, uh, expect that it will cost you a good deal of money. Uh, that's why there's this third uh, way of learning programming languages, which is uh, internet. Uh, the thing that we use for learning uh, natural languages uh, as well, right, on a daily basis. Most of us, but I think Professor Argelius is not here, but uh, most of us use uh, online tools, right? So uh, the first tool that I would like to recommend is this uh, Khan Academy. It's an amazing website when, where you can learn actually anything, not only programming. It's built by an American teacher, amazing teacher, who single-handedly created like 2,000 videos. Well, by now he has more than 10,000, I think, but he teaches anything uh, from zero to a high school or uh, undergraduate level. And he also teaches programming and um, the basics of um, computer science. So uh, this is really good if you want to start from scratch to go to this website. Um, once you uh, feel like you're ready to attend something more difficult, I would like to recommend those, uh, those five. I used heavily uh, the first one in the past, which I think is, uh, is really good. Uh, I would say maybe it's the best because uh, it forces you to actually build things. It's not only watching videos, but you have to um, try, try things on your own, which is the difficult part. So with Coursera, you can do it. There's Udacity, which is built by Facebook and big companies. They have lots of cool videos if you want to refresh some stuff uh, or um, just to know a concept uh, to a certain level without building anything. That's a way to go to. Uh, all of them, except the fourth one, Open edu.ru um, are uh, American companies, as far as I know. And the fourth one is actually an aggregator of courses in Russian. So if you want to do it in Russian, uh, that's the website to go. Um, also on uh, Coursera, you can attend uh, lots of courses that are not, um, are not made uh, in English. So there are courses in Chinese, Spanish, Italian, I really recommend them. They're the best, uh, the best universities in the world are on Coursera. And the um, last way of uh, learning is YouTube. Uh, there are lots of channels. I'm giving he you here uh, two examples. One is in English uh, and the other is in Spanish. Um, They're pretty amazing, but I would say it, these two channels in particular are not for total beginners but they help you build uh, things uh, in an amazing way, very quickly. And they go step by step. Um, there are also other channels that uh, are on a similar level to Khan Academy, but if you're a beginner, I would advise you to go to Khan Academy first. And uh, this is the last advice that I will give you when it comes to learning, is that um, I hope I'm in majority, but most of us would say that when you learn a natural language, uh, you should start using it actively as soon as possible. Basically, start speaking from, um, from the day one. It's very similar with programming languages. As, like, once you start learning a programming language, think about a project, uh, a website, a thing that you, want, that you would like to, to have, to, to build, and do it as quickly as, uh, as soon as possible. Start building things uh, from day one. And uh, with this, I'm gonna... Uh, I finished uh, the part number three, and this is the end of presentation, so uh, thank you. Yeah, so uh, yeah, let's go for, for the questions.
Um, I would say it's a bit less clear than in uh, the world of uh, natural languages, but I would uh, uh, put some money on JavaScript. Then um, in the short future, it will become like, like in English. Uh, actually, already you can build um, uh, websites, uh, computer uh, programs. Um, you can even uh, uh, program other things like uh, microprocessors. Uh, I don't really know how it works, but you can with JavaScript. And with many languages, it's difficult. It's, and there are not as many resources. Uh, but I would say that at the beginning, um, the other, because um, I also recommended Python, I would say most of the educational tools, uh, uh, I saw a research, like a statistics uh, of um, which language is used for educational purposes, and it was Python. Because there are some intrinsic, intrinsic um, values of Python that make it just easy to learn. So, uh, yeah, but lingua franca would be probably JavaScript. Ideas of stuff to build from day one? I have trouble finding ideas. Ideas, okay. Oh, that's a good question. What, uh, what's about building a conjugator for your uh, own language, like similar to, to mine? It's not that difficult. If you know the language, you just um, program the rules and uh, and uh, lots of languages don't have uh, a good uh, conjugator or declinator. Uh, even two years ago, I think, or three years ago, I uh, tried to find a good declinator for uh, Latin, and I, and I couldn't. I couldn't find one which was like uh, really good. So, yeah. Um, could be Python, could be JavaScript. Uh, those two work. Um, this declinator that I showed is built in Python. Yeah, uh, it's a declinator, uh, D E C L L I N. Well, it's in the presentation, but it's written in English, okay? It's with a C, dot com. Um. Uh -huh. So I think it's a pretty uh, similar uh, question to, to the previous one, right? Uh, but what else could you build? Um, um, what about building something similar to Anki? Uh, so do you know Anki? It's like, or Memrise. You don't have to build something as complicated as Memrise, but uh, the problem with Memrise and Anki is at the beginning, um, they're not, Memrise is quite easy to use, but Anki is quite complicated. What, what, what about uh, building something even simpler that would uh, remind you uh, to learn a given word or a set of words every uh, seven days on your phone? That could be a good project uh, for a start. Okay. Yeah, definitely. So I would say, yeah, that's the problem with the um, with with those websites. Most of them, besides Coursera, I cannot really say anything about Open e, uh, edu .ru, ru, but uh, most of those they teach you things, but uh, they don't force you to do any kind of project, and you don't have support when uh, when building something. It's different on Coursera. So if you really struggle uh, in how to apply your knowledge into like a real life project, try to find a course on Coursera that, um, that forces you to do that. And you'll find lots of support in the forum because there are other students who, who, are, at, um, who are having the, the same uh, problem. IDE, uh, okay. IDLE. IDLE. Or IDLE or 
I don't know what's IDL. Well, probably it's IDE. So first, I would have to explain. It. Well, ideal. Okay, ideal tool. So could you repeat the the question again? Okay, okay. Um, yeah, so it's IDE, it's not ideal, I, I guess. So IDE is a program which helps you to write computer programs. So it's, um, uh, in this case, for Python, there are programs like um, PyCharm, which is free. Um, what else? Uh, there's also this... Uh, yeah, this is the, the same company which uh, stands behind the... Um, uh, PyCharm. Uh, so PyCharm is really good. What else? Uh, Visual Code uh, Studio from Microsoft, also free. Um, I use PyCharm. It's pretty good. How do you think programming language knowledge helps you to learn natural languages? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, as I said, I was uh, very curious about how programming languages work. And I actually took uh, a couple of courses on Coursera which are uh, natural, natural language processing, and I think the other one was compilers. So a compiler is a, uh, is a tool that uh, states if your program is written without mistakes. So you basically write a program that knows how to say, uh, knows, knows how to evaluate everything you write in a programming language. So to do that, you actually have to understand how grammar uh, works for a programming language, and I think, uh, and it's still grammar. Um, natural languages have grammars too, and I, this, for example, helped me to look at a natural language from a different perspective. It kind of reinforced my, my process. Are there any programming languages that don't use English for keywords? <laughs> That's a very good uh, question. I'm not sure. I've never seen one. Um, does any one of you know any? Yeah, sure, but uh, for fun. Uh, but if we talk about prominent languages, like first 50 languages, probably none of them. Um, so uh, everything happened in the United States, like all this development of programming languages. And probably this is why we have uh, all of them use English as the, as the main language. Okay, okay. I haven't tried uh, this one. With, with the, I think, as far as I know, any programming language, you can still create like classes and, and sure, you know, sure. That have, you know, a different language. So most, you know, in a different, like my brother works in an office in uh, in Norway, and they have like a weird North English programming language mm -hmm. because they have all these Norwegian terms. For sure. Actually, I work in Spain, where um, many times uh, there was this uh, funny meme where um, someone find, found out that uh, Renfe, which is like Spanish a website for buying train tickets, uh, uses only Spanish on their, uh, on their website, which is a very unusual way to, to program, because you always want to make it as international as possible uh, to, to other programmers, right? Um, Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So the question is, um, if we have a list of uh, Chinese characters, right? Oh, okay, 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 okay. So what if we have uh, a list of words and we would like to group them somehow by, uh, by the radicals that they, that they use? Uh, first, we would have to find uh, some open database for the given language, right? So, uh, I mean, if you want, to, if you want it to, to be really complete, you would have to have uh, a database of, of the words in the first place, right? And then uh, you, can, you can use Python or anything, really. 
Python, yeah, Python would be really good. Uh, well, it's a very specific question, um, but it could be really uh, uh, MySQL or uh, MongoDB. Mongo, oh, MySQL is okay. MySQL, it's cool. It's my and SQL. Okay, so then I would, I would probably choose uh, Python. Uh, if you want to work with, um, like uh, all you want to do is to play with uh, text that you copied somewhere, uh, then Python is really good for, for that. Like. Um, do you have to be good in um, technology and computers to learn a programming language well, or um, can you simply be done with technical stuff while still programming well? Oh, I think you still can uh, may program quite well, even though you know nothing about math or physics. Or, and uh, I know people who work for uh, for tech companies, and they are good programmers without ever attending a, a university or not even a boot camp. So yeah, I, I had this uh, one example of a girl who works in Barcelona. Um, she used to be a hairdresser and suddenly became a programmer. So you can do it. Such a Slido. Um, whoa, oh, uh, that's a good estima estimation exercise. Um, I would say that you could build a prototype and MVP, like a minimum viable product, in a matter of months if you're if you're a good uh, programmer. It's not going to be as um, complete as Slido because Slido probably has lots of tools that we don't even know about, but that companies use when using uh, Slido. But um, like a like a prototype could be built in in a matter of months. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, by one person. By one person. Yeah. Probably people already uh, tried to do that, and uh, you'll find some open source projects on GitHub that you could basically copy and try to um, uh, tinker with it. Sorry. Could you repeat the question? Okay. Oh, I'm not sure. Uh, I think uh, linguists would be more attracted to, well, first we would have to say what is uh, imperative and functional programming. These are two um, paradigms in programming. It's like, uh, how to say that? Um, you could say it's something like uh, languages that have uh, flex, uh, like have declensions and languages that uh, don't have this concept, right? Uh, so the same in programming languages, you have pro languages that uh, have something that others do not. So one of those um, like differentiation could be being functional or imperative. Um, I think linguists would be more inclined to uh, imperative languages. I don't want to explain what it is because uh, it would take too much time. But they would be inclined to imperative languages. Uh, still, you, you can use uh, all the tools that I uh, provide you with. Uh, yeah, like uh, those five. On Coursera, you can learn uh, lots of languages, not only Python and JavaScript. Uh, literally, there are tens. Uh, you probably, yeah, there are more than five languages that you can learn on Coursera. So, um, okay, thank you. <laughs>